We begin episode 1 of Alice in Borderland with Raya Harissa playing video games and listening to his brother berate him for a lack of enthusiasm toward work. If only we could reset reality, he says sadly, paying reference to their mother who's passed away. Harissa eventually heads out to spend time with his friends, Chota and Carib. Carib finds himself on the wrong end of his boss, well, former boss, given he's fired after kissing the barmaid, Nimi, while she's on duty. As the trio begin messaging each other, we see a barrage of texts exchanged as they decide to meet in front of a station. With the three together, they deliberate over where to go from there as talk turns to zombies and video games. While talking, Carib solemnly tells his friend to get a normal life. It's clear this trio are outcasts, and Carib's words hit home to Urusu as he looks out at the crowds of people going about their lives. Accidentally causing a crash on the street outside, the boys hurry inside the train station and begin giggling while huddled together in one of the stalls. When the lights turn off and on again, the boys step outside and find themselves in a very different unexplained world. The streets are empty, eerily quiet and devoid of noise, save for the wisps of paper blowing past them. Confused, Arissa looks out at the emptiness. There's a real 28 days later vibe here as the boys head back to their respective lives, but find the once bustling and noisy places they frequented completely empty. Strangely, their mobile phones aren't working either. As they sit at Shibaya crossing while the night draws in, Arisu sports a smile as he tells the others that this turn of events is exciting. Screaming and whooping to the heavens, suddenly a projection appears on the apartment building above, informing them that the game is about to begin. With flickering red lights in the distance and a handy arrow pointing them in the right direction, the boys head off to investigate. This brings them to the GM building, a faint sliver of light in an otherwise bleak and dark world. A handy arrow flashes on as they approach, showing them the right way to go. With only three participants and time counting down, the boys are approached by a girl called Shibuk, who reveals that now they've crossed a certain point, there's absolutely no way back. They're not alone though, as a high school girl shows up and enters the game at the last second. We don't find out her name just yet, but we do find out more about the game. We begin episode 2 of Alice in Borderland with a girl called Yusagi Yuzuha rock climbing. Her father gives words of encouragement while watching from the top, fueling this girl's courage in the present. Yusagi looks out at the eerie red and black cityscape. The reds, of course, representing all those in the game who are dying. Holding a playing card, she vows to survive. After their ordeal with the game, Chota contemplates whether it was an electromagnetic pulse that caused all of this to happen. It's not a bad theory to be honest, and one backed up by the fact all the electronics are out and not working. To add insult to injury, Arisu's phone dies. While the kids sit around eating, they discuss their previous live and what happened before they entered this game. Shibuki happened to be working for a big company, but slept with her superior in order to secure a promotion. She dances around this fact though, instead changing the subject to the game itself. There seems to be a strange passing of time here, especially after seeing rotten fruit out in one of the cars. Arisu is sure there's a game master out there pulling the strings. Given the high-tech lasers, he wonders whether it could be the government or an a company involved. Chota meanwhile believes that it could be God's work. However, it's clear he's in a bad way as he winces in pain from his burn injury. While he recovers, Carib and Arisu discuss the implications of who this game master may be. While they talk, light suddenly pierce the darkness as we cut to the Toei Sendagaya apartment block. There, a whole group of players happen to be standing ready, including Yusagi. They're not alone though, as both Karub and Arisu Shota joined the ranks. With 13 competitors and a 5 of spades card to play for, a shady man wearing all black called Nidib introduces himself and tells them this is a game of betrayal. It turns out the higher the level of playing cards, then the more days they have to gain as a visa. Of course, this also increases the level of tension and risk too. Their mission this time is to find the safe zone while playing a game of tag. There's 20 minutes to complete the sin, and a series of explosives all wired up together, due to set off and kill everyone if they don't make it. No pressure then. While Chota prays for help from God, Shibuki turns up and listens to him talk. Chota feels like the odd one out in his trio given Karib and Arisu, both have unique traits while he doesn't. Shibuki asks whether he'd die for his friend's sake or not. It seems to get through to Chota, as he realizes how hard his life has been. Shibuki comforts him and eventually sleeps with him. Elsewhere, the 13-person game of tag commences as all the different competitors stagger themselves around the complex. As the intensity of the game picks up, a strange masked man begins picking off the competitors one by one with a machine gun. 
Arisu and Carib do their best to avoid conflict, but eventually realize they'll need to work together to defeat him. As Arisu starts screaming for the others to join and work together, it's Usagi who answers the battle call and begins tracking the movement of the tagger. With 8 minutes to go, things are definitely tense, but the surviving 7 manage to work together to hunt down and defeat the tagger while checking for the search zone. Given Arisu is a climber, backed up by her earlier flashback, she can easily move from floor to floor while evading the killer. Only, it doesn't seem to work given this killer seems to sport inhuman strength. They brush aside the blows and continue to attack, while Arisu appears to find the safe zone. The killer blindsides him, but Arisu stumbles upon the safe room which requires two people to press buttons simultaneously to win. With Carib caught with the tagger and the safe room in apartment 403, a mad scramble to get to the exit ensues. Arisu fights with another tagger who shows up just as all hell breaks loose. With little time remaining, Arisu and Yusabi work together to press the buttons which they do with one second remaining. They clear the game and manage to come away victorious. The killer happens to be a woman wearing a collar which blows up just as the game ends. It's clear they're not alone in this fight, and whoever's behind this has concocted quite the sick game. Carib finds a radio in the pocket of their tagger, repeating the same message again and again. The answer is in our hands, return to in the uneasy tranquility of the apartment complex, episode 3 of Alice in Borderland begins with Arisu morally conflicted after killing the tagger. Yusagi gives him some words of encouragement, though before leaving the scene. Meanwhile, Sayori Shibuki realizes she's been in this game for five days now, and with her visa looking set to expire, she needs to make a move, and quickly. She bemoans her newfound life, and reflects on how she had to sleep with her superiors just to get a promotion. However, her thoughts are interrupted by the return of Arisu and Karu who talk to the others about the radio broadcast and the ominous message about returning to the beach. With a new game coming up that evening, the team agree to work together and do their best to come out on top. Arisu deliberates over Yusagi's words from earlier as they agree this, especially when she mentions doing anything to survive. Karib heads back to the bar and finds a ring box stashed away behind some bottles of alcohol on the shelf above. He's been saving this for his girlfriend, and as he grabs it, the night draws in and a new game awaits. With Chota in a bad way, the group agree to stick together for what may lay ahead. That's easier said than done, though as the kids make it to the botanical garden for their new task. Two white tables sit with numerous tools which are free for them to use. After choosing what to use, the other table happens to sport googles that look like they're part of a VR game. Eerily uplifting big band music picks up as the kids are registered, and the game looks set to start when they place the goggles on. It's pretty impressive tech, but they soon learn that the game they have to take part in, Seven of Hearts, is a deadly game of hide and seek where one of them is the wolf and the other's the sheep. Whoever is the wolf at the end wins. The other three lambs, however, will find their collar explode and subsequently die. Realizing that only one will survive, Chota is the first wolf and they've got 15 minutes left to figure this out. Staring directly at another player, transforms the wolf power over, which Shibuki is first to realize, and takes off to hide as she's made the wolf. Carib follows after her, which eventually ends with the duo fighting. Carib becomes the wolf, but as things become more intense, Arisa winds up gaining the power, and trying his best to get the color off. As time ticks away, flashbacks to Arisu's past show his unwavering friendship to both Chota and Carib. Arisu decides to drop out of the game, and not fight for survival pleading with the others to take the power away from him. He gives an impassioned plea to his friends, but they're all too busy hiding. With the final seconds remaining, Arisu finds Carib, but he's out of time. The collar explodes, and he suddenly drops dead in front of Arisu's face. Although we don't directly see it, blood spattered on the ground hints that both Chota and Shibuki have met a grisly ant. Isagi begins episode 4 of Alice in Borderland, tending to a rabbit which she's caught in a net. Its obvious animals are still inhabiting this world, and as she snaps its neck, she heads off down the street with her dinner. On the way, she passes a grief-stricken Arisu who happens to be lying face down on the pavement. As she approaches, he tells her he'll die soon. Yusagi doesn't seem to pay much attention until she sees him again later on that day, and takes pity on him while the rain lashes down. In further flashbacks to the past, we see Yusagi and her father's relationship grow estranged. What once was a loving father-daughter experience soon turns to something else as her father embarks out alone, deciding against taking her up the mountain. This happens to be the last time she sees him, as news breaks that this world-famous mountaineer, Shinigori Yusagi, goes missing. 
Rumors begin circling that he either committed suicide or had up the mountain alone with no oxygen. Ironically, Yusagi's face down hopeless posture in the days that follow this mirror that of Arisu right now. In the present, Arisu awakens and blames himself for everyone else dying. As he curses the heavens, Yusagi brings him back down to earth by admitting that she too has been in the same position as him. Yusagi tells him that after saving her life during the game of tag, she wants to return the favor to him. This seems to be enough to spur Arisu on as day turns to night, and the duo prepare to enter another deadly game. A graffiti-covered bus sits in an underground car park which signifies the start. With mobiles in hand, the other boys greet the pair warmly as Arisu notices that one of them, a boy called Takuma, sports a sprained ankle. Although he doesn't say it outright, it's clear that this reminds him of Chota. The game rules are simple endure the trial, run the gauntlet and make it a set distance in a generous amount of time to survive. With the bus out of gas, Takuma decides to sacrifice himself to save the others. This doesn't sit well with Arisu though, but he joins the others and starts running nonetheless. They keep going until they reach a replenishment station. Yusagi is not sure they should take the drinks there, and instead they share around a small bottle they brought with them. Things soon take a turn for the worse though when they're chased by a menacing, snarling panther that appears and lusts for blood. This chasing soon becomes more hostile though as the panther grabs one of the boys, seasoned, and takes off with him. As Arisu continues on with the others, he spies a motorcycle in the back of a truck and comes up with an idea. He doesn't want to sacrifice someone else for his sake, and begins running back with the motorcycle to save Takuma. He makes it back too, but Yusagi finds herself in hot water, as she makes it to the target distance of 12,000 meters and finds the tunnel blocked. Only, it suddenly bursts at the seams as a rush of water chases her down the tunnels. Thankfully she manages to make it back to Arisu and Takuma who open the bus doors and save Yusagi at the last second from certain doom. As fate would have it, they just needed to stay on the bus the entire time, given goal was written on the side. Beaten but certainly not defeated, Takuma says goodbye and hopes they'll meet again soon. Arisu meanwhile, stands with Yusagi and contemplates whether they should go to the beach and try to stop the mastermind behind everything that's happened. Sporting a bicycle and a basket of luggage, the duo take off ready to tackle what may lay ahead at the beach. Episode 5 of Alice in Borderland begins with Arisu doing his best to try and work out where the beach is. Yusagi and Arisu are going in circles and realize their visas will run out soon, in three days to be precise, unless they get a move on. The next day, Yusagi teaches Arisu some important survival techniques. As night rolls in, Yusagi and Arisu realize that some of the boys wearing a locker key are from the same team. Watching from afar, they watch as three boys get into a car and drive off. They decide to chase on foot, which leads them to a hotel with beach written on the side, their destination. Unfortunately the duo are blindsided and knocked out, brought before an eccentric man called Hatter who seems to have the answers they seek. After a flamboyant greeting, dressed in a large robe and clearly not of sane mind, Hatter opens a sliding door in front of them. A large wall holds a series of playing cards with each one marked off with a large cross. It turns out the only way to clear the game and return to the real world is by gathering all the playing cards. Given it's impossible for one person to do it alone, Hatter encourages them to collect the cards with him. This self-proclaimed ruler believes they're in some sort of country, especially given the visas, and theorizes that, if they continue to collect all the cards then one by one they'll all manage to get out, with Hatter going first of course. This hotel complex is a very different atmosphere to the one Yusagi and Arisu are used to, as a large swarm of people party through to the night. As the sun sets, Hatter briefs the kids below who follow his every word, acting as an army for the sky. Games are completed simultaneously by this self-made army, who work together to complete different tests and gain playing cards quickly. Arisu is taken aside with Kuina, and in for a new test, to see who's good enough to become an executive at the beach. The game is deadly, featuring rising water and electrical currents. Thanks to Arisu's quick thinking and scientific knowledge, he manages to survive his game. Yusagi survives hers too, heading back with the others to the party. As Kuina talks to the pair about dating, they're both interrupted by the militants of the beach arriving. Kept in check by leader Aguni, these men immediately throw their weight around, demanding Yusagi go with him. However, Hatter shows up, and manages to convince Aguni, to lay off them for now. There's clearly trouble brewing in paradise though, as Arisu is brought before the higher-ups in an executive meeting. This, of course, coming off the back of his impressive win in the games. He listens as they discuss the various playing cards, and aside from the face cards, the only one left is the Ten of Hearts. 
Hatter's visa is going to expire soon too and as everyone in the room learns this, each of the different members of Aggie's militant force exchange knowing glances to one another. Hatter is clearly unstable, and as he talks to Urusu, he discusses the new beach, and how his old comrades abandoned him. He sees himself as the one, and only hero and tells Urusu, that heroes need tragedies to move forward. Hatter begins episode 6 of Alice in Borderland, by vowing to create a utopia at the beach, while talking to Aguni. This is, of course, a flashback as we jump back to the present and see Hatter sitting at his table, stashing a group of playing cards in his box. After a hard night of partying, a hangover Arisu is awoken by Yusagi, who comments that Hatter has taken a fancy to him. Because of this, he should use this newfound power to his advantage, and gather as much information as possible from those inside the beach resort. Along the way he hears numerous different theories, each as depressing as the next, about who the game master is, and what they're all doing there. Arisu and Yusagi refuse to be seduced by this place though, seeing through the facade of it being a utopia, and discovering the ugly truth of what lies hidden from everyone. And that truth comes in the form of a dumpster full of dead bodies. Or traitors as Kuina and Shishi call them when they show up moments later. Taking Arisu to the rooftop, the pair both comment on how much information he's gathered, and want to know what he's planning. For Arisu it's simple he wants to survive and learn exactly who or what is behind the games. Right now, he's only staying alive for Yusagi and gaining vengeance for his friends. It turns out Kuina and Shishio are planning a coup of their own, and ask Arisu whether he wants to join them in changing the status quo. Both of them are smart enough to realize the militants will take over soon, it's only a matter of when not if. When they do overthrow the Hatter, Chishi is going to steal the cards and make a break for it. Before then though, Arisu and Chishi are brought before the Hatter who happens to be passed out in his room with a gunshot wound in the chest. Hatter didn't manage to clear his game, and all clues point to Aguni and his goons being responsible. By force, all the different players are eventually forced to vote for Aguni as the new leader. With Aguni taking his place at the head of the table, Chishi rallies the troops ready to put their plan into action. While Laguni delivers a speech to the others in the main atrium, Chishi stays on lookout duty, while Larissa tries to break the safe open. Unfortunately the combination fails and as he turns around, Arisu stares in the face of Laguni's goons and Chishi, who seems to have betrayed them all. With both Isagi and Arisu captured, Arisu is forced into a dark dingy room, and tied to a chair. Isagi meanwhile, finds herself in a desperate situation with Naragi looking to force himself on her. With both of our protagonists out the picture, Kuina and Shishi put their plan into action, finding the safe hidden behind a picture of a stag on the wall. It turns out the safe Arisu found was just a decoy, and they used him as bait. Kuina stands outside the door on lookout duty, while Shishi manages to find the cards, and prepares to take off. On the way out the door though, Kuina has second thoughts and feels bad for Arisu. Unfortunately that's the least of their worries as a strange field of lasers appears around the Paradise Hotel. A new game is about to begin, and this one happens to be for the Ten of Hearts card. As all players assemble in the lobby, a girl called Momoka happens to be lying on her back with a knife through her heart. The game they're about to play is Witch Hunt, and all the men and women inside must find and burn the one responsible for Momoka's With two hours to find the culprit, episode 7 of Alice in Borderland begins with all the players quickly turning on each other, as the kids are forced to reveal what they've been up to and tells the others that Hatter was murdered and brandishes the bullet she found inside him as proof. When Aguni shows however, the militant forces rally together and exert their authority. They decide to take out the useless people and burn them on the fire outside. As bullets pierce the once tranquil hallways, the militant soldiers exert their will and start systematically killing people, and throwing them on the fire outside. It's a shocking display of power, and one that shows just how far people can be corrupted for a singular cause. With everyone distracted and fighting for their lives, in the basement a fire breaks out and threatens to engulf the entire hotel. This happens to be a ploy to bring everyone outside where Naragi is up on the rooftop, ready to snipe all the innocent bystanders. He certainly doesn't feel great about doing this, and as we see from flashbacks, he was bullied badly as a student. Chishi eventually shows and brags about how clear he is, eventually burning him with a makeshift flamethrower. As screams pierce the air, Naragi falls to his doom. Yusagi finds out where Arisu is being held, courtesy of a soldier unable to follow through with these barbaric orders any longer. Kuina finds in searching around for clues, which comes in the form of super glue to show the fingerprints on the knife. This should, in theory, reveal who the real killer is. 
Only, when they get there the sword-wielding goon called Last Boss stands ready for them. Karina does her best to evade his blows, as we cut back in time and see what happened to her. Interestingly, she was a boy before this called Hikari, and since then, has become this beautiful and incredibly skilled girl. After her operation, she head back to see her mother in hospital, who comments how beautiful she is. By comparison, it's clear Last Boss has no future and fully embraced this world when he was whisked across into the game. It an interesting juxtaposition of fate, when that sees both of them haunted by the ghosts of the past. Last Boss shatters glass across the floor as a deterrent, but it doesn't work with Kuina. Eventually she bests the man, leaving him a crumpled bloody heap on the floor. Yusagi continues up to the fourth floor and finds Arisu locked in a room. Handing the phone over to him, Arisu talks about the purpose of this game, and how it's being used to toy with people's emotions. Trying to work out who's pulling the strings, Arisu turns his attention to the game master rather than the witch. It certainly seems like quite the opportunistic time to start this game and theorizes that it could be a deliberate ploy to pick off their number. And seemingly figures out who's responsible for killing the mocha, but she's knocked out on the way out the door by one of the soldiers. Arisu suddenly stands and realizes just who the witch is. We begin the season 1 finale of Alice in Borderland with Momoka and Asahi walking through Tokyo with a phone that seems to be working. It's been 5 days since everyone disappeared and they've decided to leave a message for whoever finds it. As they descend into the subway, numerous questions remain over this scene. How did their phone work when all other electronics are switched off? Are they part of this game? And who is the witch? Well, Aguni gathers the troops in the main atrium as a final standoff sees him ready to kill everyone. Arisu and Yusagi appear, though and plead with Aguni, to see reason and work to find the witch. It turns out that witch happens to be Aguni, which he's quick to admit to. Arisu is not so sure that's the real truth though. He sees through Aguni's facade, and reveals that he and Hatter were best friends, and faked a conflict, to keep the dangerous militants in check. What began as a simple task was only made more complicated by Hatter deciding to add another rule to kill any traitors, turning this democracy into a dictatorship. Hatter turned on Aguni during his final game and Aguni was forced to fire back in retaliation. However, that doesn't excuse him from taking this opportunity to kill everyone inside of course. Anyway, back in the present Arisu deduces that they could find a way to solve the game without killing anyone else. As he points at Momoka, he tells them that she could be the witch herself. Aguni refuses to listen any longer, and as fighting erupts, Asahi suddenly dies from a laser to the head after calling herself the dealer. When it shows, she reveals there was a reverse grip on the knife, backing up Arisu's original theory that Momoka is the actual witch. Together with Arisu's impassioned plea, the pair ready themselves to burn Momoka's body until Naragi suddenly shows up and starts shooting everyone. Even worse, he spreads the fire and laughs maniacally. Aguni sacrifices himself, though and throws Naragi back in the fire, a final selfless act to save them all. As Arisu heads outside with the others to burn Momoka's body, he notices that the phone on the ground is still recording. Under the dancing flames of the fire, Arisu tells Usagi and the others that they need to stop this, no more killing. Chishi takes full advantage of this and grabs the Ten of Hearts card on the table. In the morning, Usagi and Arisu check the footage from Momoka's phone. It turns out Momoka and Asahi were responsible for setting up some of the games. They work together to join different games, sometimes as taggers, or to intentionally disrupt the flow of the game. As the footage continues, these two descend down the subway, and deep into the dealer's lair which seems to be a massive series of structures backed up by electronics and numerous suit-wearing people. They're watching all these games take place, and seem to be finding enjoyment in all this bloodshed. Are these people the game masters? Yusagi and Arisu take this information and head down to the subway themselves to take a closer look. The various different workers happen to be lying face down on the tables with bullet holes in them. With all the lights shut off, Chishi and Karina suddenly appear out the shadows, and reveal that they found this same hideout courtesy of the drawing inside the tagger's pocket. This, of course, is a direct nod toward that earlier episode with the game of tag. The drawing happens to be a map. Chishi jokes that the real leader could be aliens, or even God, but suddenly the lights turn on as Mira appears on the screen along with various snippets of all those who have died so far. She wants to give them a present which happens to be a series of new games for them to take part in. The next stage will appear at noon the following day, meaning they need to fight again. This time though, they know who their target is. As fireworks explode over Tokyo, the stage is set to begin as giant blimps show up carrying the face card 
Alice in Borderland feels like a colorful, vibrant patchwork of different shows and films. There's elements of 28 Days Later, Sword Art Online, The Purge, Saw and even Live Action and I'm Here Too. On paper, this feels like a recipe for disaster as different influences pull in all directions, threatening to tear at the seams. In reality, Alice in Borderland is a robust, well-written, surprisingly decent sci-fi treat that's well worth its weight in gold. The premise is simple, and revolves around the huck of a group of kids stuck inside a weird alternate reality world. Deadly games of life and death are played in exchange for playing cards, which are referred to as visas in this twisted dystopian world. The numbers on each card correspond to the number of days you have left to live. The more cards you collect, the more days you can survive. With a possible game master pulling the strings, kids are killed off in quick succession for either expired visas, or by dying inside the games. And the kill count is extremely high. Stepping into this unforgiving world are three lifelong friends, Computer Kid Arisu, his ladies' man friend Carib and Tagalong Choda. Together, they step into this world and immediately realize their lives are at stake. The first episode serves up a delightful starter, a palate cleanser designed to get accustomed to the games and the world in general. Across the rest of the season we are introduced to another protagonist, Yusagi. The competent climber and clearly intelligent, she eventually teams up with Arisu and the others to try and escape this nightmarish world. Each episode essentially works to showcase a different game, with a structured episodic feel interwoven around a serialized story about the world and its mysteries hidden within. Toward the middle portion of episodes, the series draws influence from 28 days later and sees our survivors banding together to face a greater threat than they ever imagined. I won't spoil what that is here, but suffice to say the second half slows slightly to show the real horror is humanity itself when faced with these desperate choices. Everything eventually spills over in a spectacular, bloody penultimate episode before a very dramatic climax ends things with a cliffhanger ready for a second season which, as of the time of writing, has not been renewed. What's particularly great about Alice in Borderland, though is just how ruthless this show actually is. Main characters are killed off, numerous supporting players come and go, while through it all the games steadily become more intense and deadly. This combination leads to some seriously dramatic moments, including one where Risu and the others are forced to outrun a threat to make it on board a bus. Another time, the kids are stuck in a deadly game of tag across an apartment complex with a safe room hidden somewhere within the numerous floors. Unfortunately, the taggers are armed with machine guns and hunt their prey mercilessly. These games all feel unique and play on video game inspired challenges in a way that feels very real and very dangerous. Some of the reason Alice in Borderland works as well as it does comes from the sound design. Pockets of silence are perfectly juxtaposed against more pulsating, adrenaline soak anthems and this balance feeds into the larger story and world building in a big way. This continues right the way through the show too, and hats off to the audio team, they've really done a fantastic job with this one. For obvious reasons, it's recommended not to watch the dubbed version of this as the original Japanese is far more authentic. If there's one part of the show that slips up, it's the characterization for the supporting characters. Because of how quickly players come and go in this series, it's very difficult to grow attached to anyone outside a couple of main protagonists the show creators seem to realize this too, and throughout the different episodes, numerous flashbacks show us the troubled past these men and women have faced. It's a nice idea in theory, but the execution is a little disappointing given we never quite get attached to anyone. The one standout from this rabble of flashes comes from Kunai, who has an absolutely fascinating past, and a really solid redemptive arc across the episode she stars in. I won't spoil what the twist is surrounding her character, but suffice to say it's a big point toward inclusivity, and a great example of how to portray strong characters in the right way. The eight episodes are incredibly addictive, though in no doubt you'll probably find yourself blasting through this in a couple of evenings. The action is fast-paced, and the various different influences behind this creation bleed through an air of nostalgia. The cliffhanger ending is a little disappointing, though and hopefully we don't have to wait too long to find out if this has been renewed. All in all though, Alice in Borderland is a welcome surprise to end the year with, and certainly one of the better sci-fi series of 2020.